and welcome to AFTV uh, in association with Angerati. I am joined now by Ignacio Rodriguez, who is a director at TetraTech. Uh, Ignacio, first of all, welcome. Th Thank thanks you. Thanks for taking Thank the time. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, let's put what we're going to talk about a little bit in context. I'm going I'm to use my words. Feel free to correct me. But uh, you've got a huge amount of experience, uh, uh, Latin America, uh, uh, America, whereas the other geographies, now Africa, uh, in this field, um, mainly around that policy regulatory uh, framework side of things, um, we, which is fantastic because we've had a narrative today um, from energy ministers, utilities, and uh, 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 power developers, and you and my overriding sense of that narrative is that something is broken somewhere in the, in the value chain. Uh, the utilities are saying, look, we're having to buy energy at a certain price and we, we don't have a hope in ever selling it on at that price. So that's not right. Uh, the, uh, uh, the power companies are saying that, that, oh, hang on a minute, we're signing all these deals, but we're never breaking ground because things keep moving. Um, so uh, there's good progress, don't get me wrong, that's the overall thing. But it seems to me, and the energy ministers are saying that, hang on a minute, my job is to get power to the people, not sign a load of IPPs and develop generation plants, and <laughs> then I can't move those electrons, for want of a better yes. word, that's another to, issue. To, to the final destination. That's right. right. So, 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 so these are all the things that I'm hearing, and, yes. uh, and I'm, uh, you know, I study engineering. I'm looking at all of these, and it's like broken, 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 broken. Uh, but clearly, the world is much marching on. And you were sat in a ministerial session and uh, uh, talking about that. But here's the question: Based on your experience, I don't want you to go into the deep dive of why this is broken. But do you what? framework actually should be put in place that gives you that guiding anchor so that all of this stuff can line up behind it? Excellent. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, I liked it very much when you said broken, 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 <laughs> because it's not generation alone. Mm -hmm. You got transmission, you got distribution, and then you have, you, know, you have the whole framework. So basically, as we use the word framework is, you know, what we call, what I call the enabling framework. And, you know, is, is having, you know, what the investors are looking for here is really is certainty. What does certainty provide? Certainty provides lower cost power generation. Within that, how do you establish it? Well, I can share a lot of my experience, you know, as, as I've done this for over 30 years. And in that context, you know, I remember I was very involved in the late 80s, early 90s when we used to discuss IPPs in the market, you know, or private sector participation in the market. So it was a slowly evolution, you know, of getting greater private sector participation. But then following that, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, and even as we speak today, I've been very involved in Latin America on the whole restructuring and privatization of, of the power sector. Basically, the conclusion is you have to look at the sector as a whole. It's not just looking transaction by transaction or project by project. So in my view, to me, the objectives of which, you know, the ministers have indicated, which is rightfully so, and it is the context, I would say, of all markets, including the United States, you know, where I'm based, is this issue to provide the lowest cost possible through, you know, competition, reliable, and efficiency. Basically, how do you do it? is by providing, again, that enabling framework. What does it mean having an electricity law that well defines you know, the role of the government and the private sector? Having a strong independent regulatory agency, which is the one that has the responsibility of, because we still say that the, the power sector is a public service, including in the United States. Why do we have a regulator? Because to meet that requirement, then they're the ones that provide that oversight over the private sector, especially in transmission and distribution, which are what we call the, you know, the, you will have the limited monopolies. So basically to answer very quickly, you know, what I see here is that uh, the discussions are kind of on the edge, but on this one, uh, and I can say, you know, I've been participating in the energy net, this African energy forums for over 15 years, actually. I don't remember exactly if it was 17 or 18 or 15 years. 
And what I see on this one different than the previous one um, was that I hear now more from the private sector, particularly South Africa, where they're asking more this issue of sector reform. It seems sector reform in Africa was kind of a very sensitive one, but regarding all these issues, and we talk about sector reform is again establishing well-defined who's responsible for what, and then at that point you can achieve. I can just say, for example, in Mexico, where I'm active right now, you know, I participated, was basically the last country in Latin America that has done through, through the major reform, and we have obtained, we've, we got last year the first two auctions uh, where we got about 6,000 megawatts of renewable energy, about $7 billion of private investments, and we got some of the lowest prices in the world for wind and solar, you know, anywhere from $30 to $50 per megawatt hour. We would not have been able to achieve that in Mexico unless we had done this major reform, new electricity law, new regulations in, altogether to respond to this need. So, uh, in a way, what you're saying is, and again, my words, you correct me, yeah. uh, is to kickstart the uh, 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 getting things moving in Africa, uh, people looked at point issues, like can we get power generation going, can we get people to build these plants, blah, blah, blah. but what you're saying is that while that may have overcome the initial inertia, if they're not careful, that can lead to all sorts of uh, uh, conflicts and, 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 and friction unless you have this, what you call an enabling framework. And an enabling framework, to my mind, is that is very different to the framework here, the framework there. That, yes. that, 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 that is still there, yeah. right? And it seems to me that everybody's yeah. talking about this framework, that framework, that Which is framework. your tak 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 that you yeah, mentioned. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but it's not this holistic enabling framework. Yes. Now, who governs that? Yeah, you, well, very good, excellent. So the first thing you need is a well-defined policy. And usually where I've been involved in the various countries, and specific where I've done a lot of this is in Latin America, is from the right time, the right moment, and it's an initiative set up by the president of the country in his first year. So within that, you establish kind of that target of moving forward to establish the whole thing. What does it mean? So first you need a clear policy. This is what we're achieving. This is what we want to get. Then within that, you start the process of drafting the laws, drafting the regulations, creating the new entities. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to create in many countries independent regulatory agencies. We had to create independent system operator. We had to do the unbundling mm -hmm. of the state-owned utilities. But those independent regulators need teeth as well, don't they? Because I Excellent. talk to regulators here. Yeah. They say, oh, I'm the regulator. I've just got an office, effectively. I'm not going to mention any names, but that's it. I, I, I've been called a regulator because this IPP thing needed us to have a regulator, so I'm now the regulator. But I have a simple answer for that. You know what? We yeah. have the same experience in right. the countries where they have not the full reform. Yeah. And why? Because who's more powerful is the entity that controls the money, that has the money. So who has the money is actually is the electric utility if it's state-owned. They have the power, they have the influence. So it's very difficult, you know, when you have a regulator with a public utility. So it's, I know some African countries are moving that direction. That's good, that's a good start, because at least you can start doing the capacity building, you know, with the locals. Figure out what is a regulator, what is the role, and everything like that. But to have the teeth is clearly, is the teeth are gonna be when they themselves have to provide on behalf of the government and the policy the control over the private sector to make sure that they comply. For example, if we talk about distribution, is what we call the key performance indicators. So having losses in the system, when you have utilities have you know, 20, 30, 40% technical and non-technical losses, well, are you talking about more generation when you have 30% losses? No, the least cost is reducing those losses. So again, when you do, and I participate also, and there's no discussion here actually in terms of the tariffs, which is a key area of the regulator. Tariff also provides the right signal to the consumer how to, again, efficiently consume that electricity and pay for that service. 
So one needs to be very carefully look at the tariff structure that you have in the, in the country. You know, for example, in Mexico, I'm working right now with a regulator establishing demand response, uh, which is basically demand control, where you have, for example, large, which for Me Africa, it's going to be very interesting if it's not applied, which is basically where you have a, a more, let's say, lower price tariff in the sense that you have already an agreement with a large industry that when needed to serve that system peak in the, in the system, the, that, that, that they'll be able yeah, to react yeah. and maybe turn on their standby generator. So it's a positive for the utility, it's a positive you know, for the customer. What does that combine as a whole that reduces the cost of the power supply? And that's the objective, right, in terms of particular developing country to make the power more accessible to the population and you, you provide it by having a more efficient power system. And when you look at, uh, when you look at that, and, the, and, and talking about the demand response, but, but moving back uh, a little bit to the central issue, um, one of the things that I see is also, I, I think somehow an inability to envision envision how to get there you know it and, and this is not an overt statement yeah. by people who are sat in your seat it's, yeah. it's a feeling that I pick up yes they understand the problem yeah. they understand the issue yeah but I get a feeling that there is an uh, there's an inability uh, inability to kind of figure out in a very simple way of yeah. like going, where do I start what's my anchor what do I go behind all of this because I've got politicians here who, who even if I'm going on a <laughs> journey, they'll make me charge less, la, 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 you know, where's the anchor? So based on your experience in Latin America, which, which has, you know, some of the very similar geographical conditions and, and did have um, rural electrification, uh, rural, uh, yeah. electrification you were talking off air, uh, off air a little bit yeah. about, okay, hang on a minute, I've, I've worked in a region where uh, we solved the rural electrification problem, we've got 98% now, and I see people sitting here going, oh my God, I can't even think about that. <laughs> Is there a simple way of, of, if anybody is listening, giving an anchor that says, listen, if, if you just keep coming back to this, the other stuff will fall into place. My answer is very simple and very short. Do you know what you need, in my experience? A local champion. A local champion at a high level. That's whether it's a president or the president of the Congress or you know, within that country, you need a local champion. Then you work. You know, my experience, I've worked then with that local champion directly, addressing all these issues. This is not simple. So basically you have to respond to everybody's concern. I've also supported that local champion because at the end the draft laws that you work on and the regulations go to the Congress or the Parliament, you know, whatever they may have, where you have different political parties. So I've also participated <laughs> in the sense, and you know what, you know, like Tomo told me, if you get it about 80 percent right, you know, in terms of the ideal, that's pretty good and we'll work on that. So it, it's just making that direction, you know, moving forward, you know, slowly, you know, to get there. And every country is completely different, you know, to see again, you know, how far you can move forward. But it's at least, you know, having that vision. The vision is, is really very crucial. Interesting, you know, again, that from having gone to so many of these energy net meetings, you know, for over 15 years, always myself, because, you know, I worked so much in Asia, I worked in Latin America, I worked in the United States, you know, I worked you know, in, in Africa, in Maghreb, Saudi Arabia. But for the first time in this one, I see from the participants, particularly the developers, mentioning now more the word, we need reforms, we need to look beyond. Somebody has said, for example, in one of the sessions I was in, that only one in 100 projects that have been identified in Africa have reached financial closure. Why? enabling environment. So you could address it piece by piece, but you know what, you resolve the generation, but what about transmission and distribution? <laughs> exactly. Then that generation cannot get to the customer. Yeah. And then if it gets to the customer and you have 40% line losses. It costs them a fortune. It costs them a fortune. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I, 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 just final question, because I'm getting the signals, is how important is the, uh, um, is the PR and marketing engine behind this? Because it's, it's all well and good having a top level champion who goes, I get it. And it's all very good having a, uh, you know, a, a Siemens or a Lekela yeah. or whoever going, I get it, because of course they would. But how do you Excellent question. Excellent, and I have a good uh, good answer in a in a couple of countries. Even after we, if we do all this, you know, when you talk about reform, you tell to the population, "Oh, your tariffs are going to go down." Well, theoretically, but none of the countries, in my view, including in Latin America, have done it. You do the reform after you have cost-effective tariffs, cost-reflective tariffs, but there's no way nobody has done it. So the challenge still becomes that. So very interesting in the countries, you know, some of the countries I've worked in, the subsidy, you know, was to all customers up to 450 kilowatt hours per month. So then, you know, we had to deal with in terms of the treasury also how to reduce and remove that subsidy. Why? Because a subsidy creates inefficiency in the use of the customers. So if you have energy efficiency measures, forget it, you know, when you have subsidized tariffs. So that contradicts itself. So the way we did it, actually in one country, it was associated with electrification rate. So let's say that country was, and actually, let's say, I'm not going to mention the country, but the electrification rate was 50%. So then it was the one that was the 450. So I worked then with the Minister of the Presidency. In terms, we did an analysis associated what would be the cost and benefits, that what would be the saving where we remove the subsidy and we only subsidize the customers up to 100 kilowatt hours per month. That difference, how much, you know, how much were we saving? Let's say $500 million. Of that amount, for us to reach the 90% electrification rate, how much would it cost us? And let's say it was $500 million per year. And to reach in five years, you know, it would cost us $250 million per year to expand it. So then we did also an electrification plan for the country with a 250 million. So at the end, the government, the president announced, we're focalizing the subsidies. We need to address this issue in our country. However, within this, now we're allocating the difference, you know, from that subsidy to the population that needs. We're going to cover 90% of the population in five years. And then I knew the inside story, and the Treasury still saved $25 million per year. So it was a win-win for all, and it was a way of selling to the population in the sense that we need to take care of the rest of the country, we need the resources, and this was the way of better, more efficient allocating the resources in the country. And who can argue with that, right? We're taking something down from you, but we're exactly. getting your brothers and sisters connected over You got there. it. Right. Right. On, on, on that note, we'll leave it. It's okay. been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. You, you, you've kind of tailed the morning quite nicely, or <laughs> the afternoon, I don't know. I uh, thank you very much uh, for watching. us. another session on AEF TV in association with Angerati. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.